hand that's on the same side that the head is turned to will go straight out and the hand behind it will go in kind of a flex position. Welcome to Tala Talks NICU. Well, you voted and the next video that you wanted to see was how to do a neurological exam on a neonate. So today I'm using this model, who unfortunately looks like he's crying, um, to kind of just go through the general neurological exam. We're not going to go through every single detail, but by the end of this video you'll have a pretty good idea of how to do a basic neurological exam. So, to start your exam, even before you touch the baby, then just observe the baby for a few minutes or a few seconds. An excellent pediatric neurologist once told me that you can get pretty much the entire neurological exam by just watching a baby. Ideally, you want to watch them when they're not hungry, when they're not crying, and when they're not asleep. So, sometime kind of between their feeding cycle, when they're hopefully awake. And what you're looking for in a healthy baby is some spontaneous movements which aren't jerky and which are very symmetrical. Obviously, if the baby is moving one side of the body more than the other, then that's very concerning. As you also know, the neurological exam is going to change greatly with the gestational age of a baby. The closer to term that the baby is, the more responsive that they're going to be. So the more spontaneous movements they're going to have, the more awake they are. They spend less time in sleep than preemie babies do. Also, they're just more responsive to external stimuli. So to noise or to touch or to anything over their face or tubes or anything on them. The other interesting thing is, the older a baby gets, the higher their tone. And we're going to talk more about tone in a second, but for now just realize that in a term baby they're much more likely to be in a flexed position rather than the extensive position of a preemie baby. So this baby's legs are actually more in sort of an extensive position, whereas for a term baby you'd expect their legs to be more flexed and their arms to be more flexed at their elbows. Other things that you should be looking for on the just kind of initial inspection is any signs of jitteriness, and we'll talk about that in a second, or seizures, or any other dysmorphic symptoms which may suggest that the baby has a neurological condition. Pay particular attention to the size of the baby's head. So if a baby has a very large head, or macrocephaly, or a very small head, microcephaly, those could both suggest that the baby has something wrong neurologically. And everybody should get very comfortable with measuring the circumference of a baby's head. Also remember this number, a term baby has a head circumference of an average of about 35 centimeters. That's very, very helpful when you're just kind of like trying to make a quick assessment after a baby is born. Honestly, if you look at enough babies, you'll get very used to the fact of just being able to look at a baby's head and be like, that looks really small. So the other thing that you can, can also suggest a neurological problem is the distance between the eyes. So if the eyes are very close together or something that we called hypotellurism, then that can suggest a type of brain injury, for example, a holoprosencephaly. Same thing if the eyes are very far apart or hypotellurism. And the way that you measure the distance between the eyes is that the length of one eye, so between the canthi, should cover the distance between the two eyes. If they're closer than the distance of one eye, then that means that they've got hypotellurism. If a baby is crying, which by the way happens a lot more in term babies as compared to preterm babies, then that itself can be a very important part of the neurological exam. First of all, you're looking for the actual facial expression during the cry. And what you're really looking for is symmetry. If you've got an asymmetrical cry, so for example, the eye is open and the mouth is drooping that way, then that could suggest a facial palsy. You're also listening to the tone of the cry itself. For example, a really high-pitched cry can also suggest a neurological injury or, for example, a drug withdrawal baby that they are notorious to have very high-pitched cries. Okay, now let's move on to actually examining the baby. So the first thing we'll start with is tone. Tone is kind of difficult to describe, but what it is, is the constant tension in the muscles that resists the passive movement of that muscle. So if a baby is hypotonic, it's very easy to move the limbs. If the baby is hypertonic, then the legs or whichever part of their body is much stiffer. This slow increase in tone from premature to mature babies 
basically is the basis of the neuromuscular part of the ballot exam. And the ballot exam, as I'm sure you all know, is the different series of tests that you can do on a baby to kind of estimate their gestational age. So different parts of the ballot testing involve moving different limbs and seeing pretty much how flexible they are. The less flexible they are, the more points they get and therefore they're higher their gestational age. For example, the heel to ear test involves moving the foot as close as you can to the baby's ear. A preemie baby would find that a much easier movement than a term baby. The square window test involves trying to move the hand down towards the wrist. Obviously this is a term baby because I can hardly move this wrist at all. So just like everything else in medicine, getting used to a baby's tone and recognizing when it's abnormal just takes a lot of experience. So even if you don't have infants that you're worried about neurologically, just get used to examining their tone and just seeing kind of how flexible they are and how easy it is to move their limbs. So you have a good basis upon which to start. I think that the best test for checking for tone, especially in a term baby, is when you put a baby into ventral suspension. So you support them under their belly. If a baby is extremely hypertonic, then basically their whole body will go into an inverted U shape. So their head will drop down and their legs will drop down. That is suggestive of a very hypertonic baby. A normal term baby will kind of try to kick out their legs a little bit, try to kick out their arms and their head a little bit. A very hypertonic baby could maybe even get into kind of like a Superman position where their whole baby is really very stiff. So. Obviously you can have low and high tone in babies that it's completely unrelated to prematurity. Honestly, often one of the things that will make us do a septic screen is a nurse will call us and tell us that the baby is just lying there like a rag doll. So just hypertonia could be very suggestive of sepsis. There are also many genetic reasons for why a baby might, might have low tone. For example, Down syndrome babies, babies with Prader-Willi, myotonic dystrophy, muscular dystrophy, myasthenia gravis. Um, there's a whole slew of reasons why a baby might have um, hypotonia. Now let's move on to jitteriness. So jitteriness, as you, I'm sure you know, is the high frequency movement or shaking at the hands or the feet of the baby. Some babies can just be more jittery than others, especially soon after they're born. But the thing that most closely correlates with jitteriness is hypoglycemia. So if you're calling somebody to tell them that a baby is jittery, make sure that you know the glucose level. Other things can cause a baby to be jittery too, most commonly hypocalcemia, or also if the baby is withdrawing from drugs. So clinically, how do you differentiate jitteriness from seizures? And I'm planning to do a whole lecture on, on seizures, but the real issue with seizures in babies, especially preemie babies, is that they can be very, very subtle signs of having a seizure. For example, the eyes might just glaze over, or they could just be smacking their lips over and over again. Or you could have the more classic seizure where you're having the rhythmic jerking of one of the extremities. And honestly, sometimes it is hard to tell the difference about whether the baby is having a seizure or whether it's just jittery and or whether the baby is just posturing abnormally, some sort of decerebral posturing or something. Ultimately, you do have to get an EEG to confirm whether it's a seizure or not. There are, however, kind of four different ways that would help you differentiate between jitteriness and a seizure. So the first one is, in a seizure, you're a lot more likely to have autonomic changes. So as the event is happening, whether it's the myoclonic jerks or whatever, you might have changes in heart rate or DSAT or changes in respiratory rate. In jitteriness, generally the baby looks really healthy and has no changes in any of their vital signs. They're just very, very jittery. The second thing is, as we kind of suggested, is that jitteriness is very high frequency. So it's kind of normally very, very quick. Whereas the rhythmic jerking of seizures is generally slower. Obviously there's overlap, but this is something that can kind of help you. The third thing is, is that with jitteriness, it's much more likely to be set off or get worse with a startle or a stimuli. So if you unswaddle the baby or touch the baby's foot, then that could be enough to kind of set the jitteriness off. Whereas a seizure doesn't really need any stimulus to get started. Obviously it's all abnormal electrical activity in the brain. The fourth kind of thing that we use to differentiate between seizures and jitteriness is probably the one that we use the most.
If a baby is jittery, then if you hold that limb, generally that will be enough to actually stop the movement. Um, whether it's the hands or whether it's the feet or, or the arms or whatever. Whereas if a seizure is happening, then even if you actually hold on, obviously you're not doing this tightly, then that rhythmic jerking will continue. Okay, now let's talk about reflexes. So in neonates, just like in adults, obviously they have deep tendon reflexes too. So you can get the knee reflex or the bicep reflex. We don't use those as often in the neonates because to elicit them, you need a completely relaxed baby, which very often we don't have. Also, we have the advantage of being able to evaluate the primitive reflexes, and as I talked about already, the tone. So let's start by going through the different primitive reflexes. Okay, let's start with the Moreau reflex. It's also called the startle reflex, and babies can end up performing this reflex even if they're stimulated by like a loud noise. Um, so the way that we can elicit it is, slip your hand under the back of the baby's neck and hold on to the baby's arms. Then, suddenly but very slowly, allow the baby's head to drop back just over a centimeter. What the baby will do is lift its arms up suddenly over its head and open up its palms and then start crying. And that is considered a symmetrical, intact Moro reflex. The gag reflex is very helpful, especially when you're evaluating an infant for whether they need cooling therapy or not. So. It also develops very, very early. So the gag reflex is one of the earliest reflexes. It develops kind of in the second trimester. So either you can use a gloved finger and just put it into the back of the oropharynx until you can kind of elicit the baby to gag, or obviously you might be doing it incidentally. If you're intubating the baby or if you're placing an OG tube, that might be enough to show that the baby has a gag. And what you'll see is that the baby kind of just retches or just really gets very upset with the idea of something down the back of their throat. The rooting reflex is a reflex that develops uh, pretty late. So kind of like um, in late preterm term babies. And that's where you touch the side of the mouth or the cheek and the baby will move its head towards the stimulus and open its mouth, kind of ready to eat. So that really is a very mature reflex. The suck reflex is really just like it sounds, if you place anything in the baby's mouth, then the baby will start sucking on it. So normally I do that with a gloved finger. You shouldn't just evaluate whether the baby is sucking, but how strong that suck is. So the same thing, kind of get used to the general strength of a preterm versus a term baby when they're sucking. The palmar grasp reflex, or just when babies kind of clench their finger around a stimulus, develops at about 28 weeks. So really kind of any stroking in the palm of the hand will cause the baby's fingers to close over that. And you can see it in the unit, babies grabbing their OG tubes and grabbing their ET tubes, trying to get them out. And the asymmetric tonic reflex, which is also called the fencing reflex, develops at about 35 weeks. I have tried this several times with this baby and it's just not gonna work. So I'm just gonna show you on me what that reflex looks like. So what happens is, is you turn the baby's head to one side and immediately the baby's hand that's on the same side that the head is turned to will go straight out and the hand behind it will go in kind of a flex position. So almost looking like the baby's fencing. This is also a primitive reflex. So a term healthy baby would have all of these primitive reflexes intact. If they're missing some of these reflexes, then that's very concerning about a neurological injury. And I'll talk about that more in the HIE video. Before we finish, let's talk about the cranial nerves. Again, just like we talked about with generally inspecting the baby, a lot of the evaluation of the cranial nerves can be done by just observing the baby. So for example, when the baby is crying, you're evaluating cranial nerve seven. So if they have facial nerve palsy, then that cry will be asymmetrical, like we said, with the eye of the facial nerve palsy, the eye would be open on that side and the mouth would be drooping on the opposite side because this muscle wouldn't be working to pull the mouth down. So that would be considered a cranial nerve seven palsy. You can check cranial nerves two and three by evaluating the pupillary light reflex. So just like in adults, you can shine a light into the baby's pupils and you should see those pupils constrict. If cranial nerves two and three are intact, then they will appropriately constrict. The ability to suck evaluates the nerves 5, 7, and 12, 
and the ability to swallow evaluates the cranial nerves 9 and 10. So there's a whole bunch of cranial nerves that are working great if the baby is able to suck and swallow. Cranial nerves 3, 4 or, and 6 can be evaluated by watching the eye movements. So especially by eliciting the vestibulo-ocular reflex, also called the doll's eye reflex. And this actually exists in older patients as well. And what that is, is when the head is passively moved to one side, the conjugate gaze of the eyes moves on the opposite side so that the retina of the eyes, the fovea, is fixed on one point. So if you can imagine if somebody else is moving my head, then my eyes are moving in the opposite direction to my head so that they stay fixed on one point. This happens as in neonates and it's the doll's eye maneuver. So basically by checking the pupils, by looking at the baby crying and by making sure that they can suck and swallow, you're pretty much covering most of the cranial nerves. Lastly, let's go over brachial plexus injuries. So the brachial plexus is the collection of nerves that innervates the arms. So in very traumatic births, so for example, there's a shoulder dystocia and the head is out, but the shoulder gets stuck, or the baby is really big, or um, the pelvis is really small, then sometimes those nerve roots can get bruised or even completely ripped apart. And it will result in the baby not being able to move their arm. So Herb's palsy is a palsy of the lower nerve roots of the brachial plexus, so C5, C6, C7. And you'll notice just by examining the baby that the rest of their limbs are kind of moving, but they're keeping that injured arm completely still. When you try to elicit the moreau, then only the unaffected arm will kind of flip backwards. So that's a pretty good diagnostic test for an Herb's palsy. When the baby is completely resting, then the arm will be in an extensive position. It will be externally rotated and the wrist will be flexed in a flexed position. So that is kind of pretty characteristic of an Herb's palsy. The baby should still have a grasp reflex though. The other brachial plexus injury we see is of the lower nerve roots, so C7 and, and, and T1, and that is called Klumpke's paralysis. And in that case, the baby kind of holds the hand in kind of like a claw-like position, and the baby lacks the palmar grasp. Well, that was a lot of information. I really hope that you did learn something. If you want me to go over any particular topic, I am going to cover seizures and HIE soon, but if there's something else you'd like me to discuss, then please comment below. Otherwise, please remember to like and subscribe and just enjoy your learning. Thank you. Bye-bye.